Now we'll talk about sculpture. Sculpture is an important visual practice, an important practice that existed through centuries and which actually reflects, which remained as an important documentation. Sculpture is used by historians, art historians and various other people to read, to understand, to speculate about history, about past, about the cultural practices of the past. And sculpture comes to represent the past and its culture and the kind of practices, not only culture but the social dimensions and the society, the politics and different aspects of the society. The sculpt so sculpture is not just a visual form but sculpture is an object of archaeology, an object of archaeology in the sense that you can dig layers of meanings and layers of history when you look at sculpture. You can read those layers when you look at sculpture. And now we'll talk about sculpture and what are the ways and how many ways sculpture is made, what are the materials with which sculptures are made, and we'll look at different examples from around the world, from Europe and as well as um, America, as well as India, and we'll try to understand what are the ways sculpture has been made and can be made, and how can we understand sculpture, its transformation from the early stages of its practice to the present stage. Sculpture, what is sculpture? Sculpture is a branch of the visual arts, right? It is part of the fine arts. It is the branch of the visual arts that operates in three dimensions, right? Unlike painting or unlike a dyed cloth or unlike a painting on the paper or the wall or a two-dimensional representation, sculpture has three dimensions, right? Sculpture can be seen from all the sides, from four sides and you can turn around the sculpture and you can look at the sculpture. The sculpture, the word sculpture, originates from the Latin word sculptir, you know, sculpir. Sculpir means to carve. Basically, sculpture was done in stone. Extensively, sculpture was done in stone in the ancient times, in the pre-modern times, in the earlier times. So, which is why sculpture, stone sculpture could survive all these years and we still have stone sculptures housed in the museums, you still have stone sculptures in the situation and sculptures were always planned along with the architecture. The basic thing about sculpture and particularly the monumental sculpture, the stone sculpture, sculpture always had a significance in relation to architecture. Sculpture had always been planned along with the plan of the architecture. For example, temple sculptures. Temple sculptures are planned along with the planning of the temple architecture. <clears throat> so, in the context of Indian temple sculptures, these sculptures acquired meaning and they are placed on the basis of certain principles, certain shastras. And Vastu Shastra is one of the important uh, grounds on which architecture as well as, you know, uh, sculptural placement has been based. So, apart from Indian temple sculptures, if you take <clears throat> the European examples also, for example, the Greek sculpture, they were placed along with the architecture, along with the planning of the architecture. So, sculpture very rarely existed isolatedly. You know? Sculpture did not exist as a separate entity, but it was planned and it was designed for architectural, for, I mean, part of the architecture, you know. You have a niche in the architecture, you place a sculpture there. So, sculpture, uh, the monumental sculpture, sculpture particularly in stone, and along with the stone sculptures, you have bronze sculpture and you have terracotta sculpture. So, these three mediums are very important in the sense, uh, throughout history, from a very early stage in the historical formation to the later stages, these three materials have been extensively used. So, stone is one of the early material for sculpture. 
even it goes into the prehistoric times. Uh, bronze comes at a metal age, iron age, bronze age. At, a bronze, at, at the bronze age, you have bronze uh, being used. And terracotta is something that again continues, uh, continued to be used from uh, the pre-modern pre times to the later times. So you see these three mediums, particularly when it comes to sculpture, uh, have a long history into the human civilization. All the civilizations more or less used these three materials. Uh, so now we'll look at uh, what are the types of sculptures. So one, scul one type is the round sculpture, right? So which is very familiar for all of us. Round sculpture where it stands on its own. It's a freestanding sculpture. You can place it on a pedestal and it stand, stands on its own. You don't need support for it. Another uh, type of sculpture is uh, relief sculpture. Relief sculpture is something that you can make out of stone. You can carve a stone or you can make out of clay and burn it and make it a terracotta relief sculpture. And you cannot make it stand free but you have to place it on the surface of the wall right so relief sculpture needs a background it is planned along with a background so all the temple sculptures that we get to see are largely relief sculptures most of them are relief sculptures and they are placed on the surface of the temple on the architectural plan of the temple Relief sculpture uh, can be of various degrees, right? It can be low relief or it can be high relief. And we can see as we go along, we, we will see some examples of relief sculpture where you have different degrees of relief sculpture, the low, low relief, medium relief, and the high relief. So what are the materials we can use for sculpture making? Sculpture uh, is made in clay, as we have seen, Sculpture is made in clay and if you burn the clay, if you bake the clay, it will become a terracotta sculpture. If you don't bake the clay and if you use the clay and you take a mold and then you cast it, then you can cast it either in bronze or in wa wax or in other materials. So we'll see that when we go come to casting. And another material, important material as we have said is stone, uh, which can survive you know, the weather which can survive the times. So stone has been a very strong material for sculpture and wood is another material. We have very few examples of wood sculptures, uh, though, but we, ha we do have some examples of wood carving and wo uh, wood as a material being used for sculpture. Another uh, modern material is plaster of Paris. Uh, bronze and other metals, you have different metals used for uh, uh, sculpture making. But bronze is the dominant material. Bronze because it is very strong and it is very durable. So which is why you get to, we get to see bronze sculptures from 3rd century BC to 2nd century BC, in fact 4th century BC from Greece. So bronze has been a very strong material which survived uh, uh, the uh, time. And paper pulp, paper pulp is a very commonly used material by, uh, you know, craft makers as well as artists and uh, another modern material which is very recently uh, uh, developed is fiberglass and fiberglass has been developed as an alternative to bronze because fiberglass gives the same kind of visual effect of bronze but it is not so durable uh, and fiberglass is more cheaper than bronze bronze is more costlier a material than fiberglass. So fiberglass is used extensively for lots of commercial sculptures, public sculptures, you know, um, and for temporary purposes. So another traditional material is uh, cement concrete. Traditional in the sense, uh, in the sense of the art schools uh, use cement concrete for casting. So in the modern times, that has become a conventional material for casting because it is relatively cheaper and uh, it is more durable uh, unlike let us say a plaster of Paris. Plaster of Paris is also used for casting uh, a mold but cement is more uh, durable than plaster of Paris. So what are the processes of uh, a sculpture? 
sculpture can be made in additive process. For example, you make a sculpture out of clay. What you do when you make a sculpture out of clay is you add clay. You add, you make form by adding clay, right? So you are adding, so which is why it is additive. And another is subtractive process. Subtractive process is you are subtracting, you are removing. So carving, whether it is stone carving or wood carving, uh, is an example of uh, subtractive process. Within the process of sculpture, uh, casting is an important process where bronze casting, for example, or later other materials are used for casting, brass is used. So casting is another process of sculpture and the very modern, very recent process that has evolved in the 20th century is construction and assemblage. You know, you assemble different things, the things that are already available and you can put them together and then make a sculpture. So you don't, you don't follow traditional conventional processes uh, of making sculpture, but in the, in the process of construction and assemblage, you can use different uh, materials that are already available in front of you and then construct and then assemble them and then make a form. So these are more or less four processes, uh, processes that are involved in sculpture making. Now let us see what is modeling. Modeling is a process of manipulating soft materials, that which is clay largely, that can be shaped by the sculptor's hands to create a three-dimensional form. Right? So clay is a soft material if it is not dried and you can manipulate a form, you can create a form. Right? So because the artist <coughs> adds materials to build the sculpture, modeling is an additive process as I was mentioning you. Media for modeling include clay, plaster, paper mache and wax. So when you model you can use wax, people use wax for modeling and then later cast it in brown, uh, bronze. And you can also use plaster, plaster of Paris, to model a sculpture, right? Before it gets dried, you can actually model a sculpture. And paper mache is another very convenient material for modeling. So this is an example, um, this particular image is an example of clay modeling. And you have clay modeling tools that you get, or you can make your own tools uh, according to your own convenience, and you can uh, create forms, you can create three dimensional forms. This is an example of clay modeling and this is an example of portrait sculpture. So here Ernst Durek sculpting, he's modeling Rabindranath Tagore's portrait, right? So portraiture is an important uh, uh, practice in academies particularly where, and portraiture is extensively used and we get to see these busts, this portrait of important people at different places and in offices sometimes. So you can see here how uh, a model is used that is here, Tagore. Uh, an artist is, by looking at Tagore, he is creating a <coughs> bust, a portrait of Tagore. So here he is using clay for that and later this was transferred uh, into bronze. So after modeling we have carving. What is carving? Carving dates uh, dating from prehistoric times. So you can see examples of carving on the cave walls, uh, small stone carvings, uh, very rudimentary though, but carving, uh, uh, you get to see the examples of carving. May not be monumental sculpture, you don't have great sculpture, but the efforts of carving has been there and you can see the examples. So it's a process in which the artist subtracts or cuts away from the solid material to reach the desired form. You have a form in your head and then you create that by removing what you have in, in your hand, by removing the extra material that may be stone or ivory or any other strong material or solid material. You remove the extra material that is there and you reveal the form that you want to reveal. And for example, the very early examples of uh, carving is uh, an example coming from Willendorf. There is an example called Venus of Willendorf and it's a very small four inch 
uh, four inch sculpture but it is carved out of stone so it, it, it is a very good example of uh, carving being used in prehistoric times right so because the artist abstracts to reveal the sculpture carving is a subtractive process once a piece is carved out of the solid form it cannot be put back unlike additive process if you put more clay you can remove it but carving one is to be careful once you chip off the material you cannot put it back it has to be manipulated it has to be left like that or maybe you have to throw your sculpture for carving you have stone wood and sometimes people use dry clay for example the clay is dried you can actually carve it and sometimes people also carve the dried plaster of Paris so you can carve any material which which is carvable and uh, you can make sculpture out of it and for crafts if you look at crafts ivory uh, is another important and prominent material people use and artists use to carve so ivory carving is also a very uh, prominent practice so this uh, these are examples of stone uh, sculpture so you can see on the left side an artist is carving using a small chisel and a hammer and he is carving a relief sculpture and this relief sculpture is quite low relief as you can see it's not very pronounced it's very shallow it's very low and on the right side you have an example of freestanding stone sculpture so we have two examples here uh, of stone carving one is the relief sculpture another is the freestanding sculpture and the freestanding sculpture is of Augustus a Roman emperor and it's very realistically carved and it is uh, carved in such a way that it is placed in the public in the sense like we have public statues now of major important politicians and historical figures so this was placed in the city of Rome so that people can see him and he's standing in such a way that he's addressing the crowd right by lifting his right hand as if he is talking to someone uh, not someone but he's talking to a crowd so it is like a public address right so the sculpture was placed in the public space in the crossroads of the city within the crossroads of the city this is an example of Indian sculpture Indian stone sculpture and this is Elora this is coming from cave number 14 at Elora and this is a very popular form of Shiva which is Nataraja Nataraja and this particular dance form I mean, Nataraja uh, form of uh, Shiva has two uh, forms like two kinds where one form of dance is the dance of creation another form of dance is the dance of destruction so here as you can see the figure is uh, seemingly moving very slowly and there is a sense of elegance here and you can see a sort of an S carve and if you look at it you can see you can actually draw a carve if you kind of draw uh, a line along the body of Shiva in the center so it's very elegant and you can see as if Shiva is about to lift his right leg right so he's holding that right leg and there is sense this sense of elegance and the slowness and the rhythm of dance so all this suggests us that this is a dance of creation it is not a dance of destruction and this is relatively a high relief as you can see here Shiva is the Lord Shiva is appearing as if he's coming out of the surface of the stone and he is about to dance or he's dancing and in the process of dancing he's trying to come out of the surface and you have surrounding uh, the image of Shiva in the center you have angels you have the divine figures and the gods and goddesses witnessing his dance witnessing his creative dance uh, the dance of creation so the sculpture is a relief sculpture which is relatively a high relief and there is a lot of dynamism is another is an important factor of sculpture right so the way the sculpture moves and how you 
create a sense of movement uh, within the sculpture. There are two kinds of dynamisms. One is the representation of dynamism within the sculpture, but when you represent dynamism within the sculpture, the sculpture itself becomes dynamic. So for example, here the movement of dance, dance is a dynamic movement, right? It is not someone sitting or standing or, or, or lying down, but dance is a movement. It, so the dynamism of the form also creates, I mean, when, when you represent a dynamic form, it also creates a sense of dynamism for the viewer, you know. It is, the sculpture becomes dynamic, you know, the form becomes dynamic. It is not, so the dance itself transforms the movement uh, of representation. Dance is an idea. You represent dance, but the way you represent dance, it makes the sculpture dynamic, right? The sculpture acquires the qualities of dynamism, right? So when you look at it, you see the sculpture appeals to you as if it is moving. You get this sense of you know, movement, you feel that the sculpture is going to move, it is moving. So this is a very, very uh, impressive quality that you can see in Elora Caves, for example. If you go to Elora Caves, you can see these qualities where the artists have created the sense of movement and dynamism in the sculptures. So it is stone, it is static, but the artist can create these, you know, sensibilities. Uh, within the sculpture. So this is one of the examples of uh, such sculptures from Elora. This is an example of wood carving, right? You can see you have different stages here. How do you carve? It is crude in the beginning. You carve in blocks and slowly you uh, develop details and intricate uh, depths within the sculpture and you add more and more expression or you refine the expression. So wood carving is relatively an easier technique than the, sculpt, uh, than the stone carving because wood is relatively softer a material than stone, but it is a different technique altogether. The way you carve wood and how the fibers of the wood move and you have to have an understanding of wood and the understanding of the movement of the fibers. Unlike stone, where stone do not have those fibers, Stone is a solid material, right? It doesn't have fibers. So stone has a different treatment of carving than wood. So this is another uh, sort of a spectacular uh, example of dinosaurus. So sometimes artists join different uh, wood pieces, uh, uh, different parts of the sculpture and then carve. So you can create uh, such monumental uh, fantastic sculptures in wood and wood is a lighter material uh, compared to stone and which has more possibilities and wood carving is also used in uh, furniture for example we have lots of furniture where wood carving is used but it's a more ornamental character not a sculptural character uh, furniture is more functional rather than aesthetic i mean you have aesthetic dimensions to for nature, but it is not used for the purposes of sculpture. You use your chair, your table, your furniture, unlike sculpture where the sculpture is used to just see. It is only for visual purpose. So casting is uh, another important technique of uh, sculpture, right? So for bronze casting is, uh, is a traditional material and it's been used in more or less all the traditions, uh, all the regions. Casting is the method of making a mold. So first you make a mold from the sculpture and casting uh, it in a durable material such as bronze. So you make a mold of the sculpture and then in that mold you fill or you use a casting material, right? So what, what, uh, there are two different methods of casting. One is lost wax casting, another is sand casting, right? So traditionally, lost wax casting is extensively used. So when you look at sand casting, what is sand casting? Sand casting is more, um, you know, it's, uh, it's very simple in one way. 
it doesn't need a lot of equipment so you can actually make an image in the sand you can dug out uh, dig out uh, parts of sand and then you can create an image or you can use a sort of a uh, form and then create image of that in the sand and then you pour liquid material that can be wax that can be plaster of paris that can be cement or any other liquid material that gets solidified later right so and you uh, that is one kind of a casting which doesn't need much of an equipment uh, another type of casting which is being used uh, from across the regions is lost wax method it is uh, traditionally an italian met method but in rel with relative differences you have this method used in different regions and even in india you have this particular method used by different uh, artisans within india and for example chola bronze casting is uh, one of these ways of lost wax uh, methods okay so it refers to the process of creating the sculpture from wax okay and you create a sculpture from wax and then cover it with a ceramic shell right or you create a sculpture in clay and then you take a mold of it and you make a wax cast out of that mold and then you create a sort of a ceramic shell around that uh, wax cast wax shape or wax form then when you pour metal inside it and you can you know you can make a hole and then you can pour metal into it and wax when the metal goes in because the metal as you can understand uh, would have high temperatures and wax will melt away it will evaporate so in the place of wax you know you get metal uh, metal goes inside and it occupies the form uh, made by made in wax and wax gets evaporated so which is why it is called lost wax method where you don't get the wax wax you don't find at the end of it wax gets evaporated wax gets lost so which is why it is called lost wax method and you get a bronze sculpture out of at the end of it and this is an example of bronze sculpture a sculpture made by devi prasad roy choudhury commonly known as dp roy choudhury and this is a dandi march he made it after independence and it is installed in delhi and if you can, you can see it in delhi and uh, the the figure of gandhi in the front and this is dandi march you know uh, the salt uh, satyagraha and all that uh, if you look at the figure of gandhi in the front gandhi holding a stick and in the gesture of walking uh, so this particular figure of mahatma gandhi is used for public sculpture and if you see public sculpture if you see uh, a sculpture or a statue of gandhi mostly you will see gandhi standing like this only very recently artists have tried experimenting with the idea of this particular gesture or this particular posture and they have tried uh, creating other postures and gestures of gandhi but this is an example of bronze casting and you can so uh, uh, devi prasad roy choudhury have casted them separately and then joined them later this is uh, a traditional example this is uh, nataraja again from chola from tamil nadu it's called uh, chola bronze nataraja right so chola uh, nataraja is a very famous uh, uh, famous sculptural form though it was used for religious purposes uh, for worship and uh, other religious purposes why it is called chola bronze because this technique and these sculptures were produced during the chola times in tamil nadu so if you look at this uh, nataraja is in the dance posture and compare this with for example uh, the elora dance uh, elora nataraja which was more elegant this is more slightly uh, kinetic and there's a lot of movement there's a lot of speed unlike the elegant slow gesture slow movement and you have a sort of a circle in which nataraja is placed and this circle is nothing but the spiritual circle of fire and uh, it's a very 
compact sculpture. So this is a traditional example, an example from traditional art practice of bronze casting. So another, uh, so we have seen carving, we have seen molding, we have seen casting. So how mold is transferred into cast, and the last technique that we can discuss is construction and assemblage. This particular technique is uh, evolved in the early 20th century where you know artists were experimenting different methods of sculpture making. So uh, for example, uh, the, the artist Pablo Picasso is the one who sort of started experimenting along with George Braque. So these two artists, uh, Picasso and George Braque, they started experimenting with collages basically the technique of collage using papers you cut paper different colors uh, color colored paper different kinds of paper and you make images out of paper which was a new technique then people have been using different materials pigments uh, to create images so these two artists tried to experiment to create images out of cutting papers and pasting on the uh, pasting them on the surface. So it is called collage and collage is very popular nowadays. So they sort of invented the technique and after a while instead of using papers, uh, uh, colored paper or different, different kind of textured papers, they started using different materials like wood, wood planks and uh, metal sheets and different kinds of durable materials apart from paper or cardboards. So from there you get to uh, see an evolution of sculptural forms where by using assemblage and construction. So they used sculpture, uh, they used th these ready-made different f materials and, and forms, they created uh, sculpture and this is an example of such uh, experimentation. This is by Picasso, it's called guitar and you can see he's using, uh, he's using the leftover or the left out or the discarded wood planks and he, he's just cutting them and then placing them like collage right he's not carving or he's not uh, he's not making like a conventional sculpture so this is a very uh, creative and very charged kind of a method for example this where he's using a metal sheet and metal wire and he has created a sculpture of guitar Right? So you have one guitar done in the wood planks by using discarded wood planks and here he is using a thin metal sheet and he is creating by using uh, and by placing them uh, he is creating a form. So this is more abstract in appeal right? and which is different from uh, what we have seen in terms of form, in terms of movement, in terms of the visual appeal. So <clears throat> this is a uh, one of the modernist experimentations and one of the modernist endeavors to sculpture and artists have tried using such experimentation and uh, many of the artists in India got also influenced and uh, even now artists try and if you look around in Hyderabad, uh, the artists have tried uh, making sculptures and they have made uh, beautiful sculptures out of discarded junk, you know, uh, out of machine parts and they created sculpture. So this tradition, if you look, look around this place in Hyderabad and uh, at different points, you can see these metal sculptures made out of machine parts, made out of automobile parts. This particular practice goes back to the early 20th century where you know Picasso tried to, Picasso and Braque tried to create this new method of sculpture making. Um, this is a very famous and very interesting sculpture by Pablo Picasso. What he did, he did nothing but he just juxtaposed two different parts of a bicycle together and created something called bull's head. When you look at it, it reminds us of the head of a bull. And how did he create this? He created this by placing the handle and the seat of a bicycle. The handle of the bicycle is upturned and a seat is placed, the bicycle seat is placed in the center. And when you look at it, you compare or you relate this with our image of the bull's head, right? So this particular kind of 
practice again is contributed by Pablo Picasso, right? So the assemblage, so how do you assemble and what forms can be put together to create another image? You know, this is a new method that got invented in the early 20th century. So let us look at some of the examples of sculpture. So we have discussed about methods of sculpture making and certain uh, techniques of sculpture making and let us look at uh, what kind of sculptures uh, that happen around uh, in the world. And in, so this is uh, an early example of uh, Indian sculpture. It is Buddha from Sarnath coming from Gupta period. And it is, uh, this sculpture is considered art historically a very important sculpture. Gupta period is considered as classical period in the context of Indian sculpture. In the context of Indian sculpture, Gupta period is defined by art historians and historians as the classical period and the sculpture coming from that period as classical sculpture. Why is it classical? If you look at this slide on the screen, you have Buddha sitting in the meditative posture, right, with crossed legs. And you have, if you look at uh, his face, it is very calm and you have the eyes closed and the eyes are uh, calm, it gives uh, the effect of being calm <clears throat> and these eyes are called lotus eyes and this is the time when lotus eyes, this particular method of carving eyes have evolved and the face looks very compact, the face uh, doesn't show as if it is uh, having any movement or it doesn't show any kind of a crudeness about it. The face looks very refined. The face and uh, the eyes and the lips and the nose, the organization of face is very uh, stable, right? It's very beautiful. So the classicization of face happens. And if you look at the figure, the entire body of the uh, statue of uh, the sculpture of Buddha, you'll see you can actually draw an equilateral triangle. You can draw a triangle from the tip of his head like that and then you can join the triangle at the base. So he is sitting actually within that very equilateral triangle. And equilateral triangle is the most balanced shape in the geometry, most balanced triangle in the ge in the geometry. It has an equilateral triangle is also uh, it also has uh, symbolic value uh, to it as a shape. So and the, and you look at the carving. If you look at the carving, the body is carved with a sense of smoothness, right? And it is a very symmetric sculpture. So the body is smooth and the body is attached to a halo and you have a very big halo which is again a new invention in the context of sculpture. Halo is emerges at this point of time uh, with its intricacy, with its expressive quality and it is symmetric in the sense if you divide the sculpture into two from the center, the left side is equal to the right side, right? So in all the senses, the balance both visually in terms of you know the way the figure of the Buddha is sitting in terms of the internal balance right if you look at the face of Buddha and the comfort of his posture it shows the internal balance so all kinds of balances here the internal balance the balance of the sculpture where you have two divine figures on either sides you have a halo and the textured carving of the halo contrasted with the smooth surface of the figure of the Buddha, right? So all these evolutions, all these developments and the refinements of sculpture made this particular period uh, a classical period, right? So this is a very good example of different techniques and different methods within carving, how to carve uh, a form or a shape or an area 
sm softly, smoothly, so that it gives a feeling of the flesh and blood. And you can see here the feeling of the realism in the figure, and which is contrasted with the ornamental decoration. So the contrast is another formal element, the contrast of two areas, which kind of projects the softer area forward and uh, from, from the textured area. This is again another famous Yakshi sculpture coming from 2nd century um, AD, uh, Christian era. Uh, this is a sandstone sculpture called Didarganj Yakshi. Yakshi, again a fertility figure in, in, the, in the Buddhist mythology. So, she, if you look at the refinement of carving, you know, the refinement of anatomy and the elegance of the figure, you know, so uh, <clears throat> it is the, the bulged breast, for example, and the pronounced body is symbolic. It is symbolic in the sense uh, Yakshi's, Yakshi figure is the figure of fertility, right? So the fertility is shown in the beauty and in the blossom of the figure. So the figure and the anatomy of the figure and the pronounced uh, physiognomy of the figure is not just material, is not just physical, but it is symbolic, it is divine, divinely intended. This is another example of uh, Yakshi. But not only Yakshi, you have beautiful elephants over there. And this Yakshi is termed as Shalabanjika. Shalabanjika is uh, a Yakshi who is holding the branch of the tree. And we get to see such examples in Indian sculpture where Yakshi is holding the branch. That means she is symbolizing the flourish. She is symbolizing the fertility and the greenery and the um, flourish, the development 